I'm really delighted to introduce our first practitioner panel, Women on the Blockchain, from proof of concept to implementation, and to introduce our moderator, Kelly Matheson. So Kelly's the Chief Client Experience Officer at Digital Asset Holdings, and she's uh, the creator of the multi-party application framework called DAML. And Kelly spent 26 years at JP Morgan in clearing and collateral management and custody and securities lending before joining of the leadership team at Digital Asset. So Kelly is uniquely positioned to monitor, mo sorry, moderate this amazing panel, and uh, I think it's going to be great. Kelly will introduce her panelists. Thanks, Kelly. Take good, it away. Oh, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Yeah, we're very much looking forward to to having the conversation uh, on this. It takes a little bit of the last panel and now um, is gonna leverage some incredible expertise of my panelists to talk about how it's actually now starting to work in real world enterprise grade productions. And so thank you to all of you joining for today. If I could, I'll just take a few moments to set the stage for our panel discussion. Um, as you will have just heard in, in the last panel, but now to expand on it, Blockchain technology itself has been around since 2009 when Bitcoin, when the Bitcoin network first went live. Um, distributed ledger technology, of which I would say blockchains are perhaps the best known example, um, has since been leveraged in and across a variety of uses in financial services, from securities issuance and trading to clearing and settlement, post-trade processing, and across the financial aspects of other industries, healthcare claims, supply chain processes, insurance processes, policies and payments. And as the panelists today will represent in detail, we're now in a period of incredibly transformative, transformative potential that's becoming realized. Um, the initiatives they lead that they'll be able to, to talk about are well beyond POCs and are affecting real world change in and across these sectors. And so to set the stage for what they'll share as their experience in an increasingly interconnected global economy, technology, and trusted data are criti critical to success. Yet the legacy software systems, at least from my personal experience, my path um, that underpin these services, um, the commerce between them, they're isolated, they tend to be disconnected, inefficient. There's um, poor or sometimes non-existent communication between core business systems. And the result is that customers, partners, vendors, they all have a lack of shared authoritative data. And as a result, the interactions are anything but seamless. Each party must constantly reconcile records, introducing risk and um, embed unnecessary um, uh, harmful operating costs. But fortunately, the panel today um, are going to bring us experience that, that persistence beyond these business problems and opportunities for growth, for new revenue, is the, is the way forward. They're tackling current and complex operations. They're challenging the, um, the structure of unclear workflows that span multiple organizations, drain resources, and they're finding new ways of structuring solutions, mutualizing workflows, and building these interconnected networks that, um, that are the focus for the, for the way forward in financial services and across other industries. So today's panelists are an exceptional group of industry experts that are actually doing, importantly doing, not talking about and not um, testing, but doing and leading this transformational work. They're tackling these challenges to create capitalized in both financially and technological ways on the opportunities that are created with blockchain, DLT, and smart contract technologies. And so what I'd like to do is um, I'll call out to each one in turn and, and ask herself uh, to ask her to introduce herself. And if you could, in the introduction, give a little bit of information for the attendees today on a key topic related to blockchain or distributed networks that is being used or discussed at your organization. If you could not only introduce yourself, but introduce your company and what you're focused on in this space. Um, and with that, um, may I first introduce um, Janina Farr, who is the Vice President of New Digital Markets at Deutsche Börse. And Janina, could you give us an introduction? Sure, thanks for having me, Kelly. Um, as Kelly said, I'm the VP of New Digital Markets. I'm leading our partnership management and our governance um, structure of D7. Um, D7 is a really key pillar of our digital strategy. D7 is our regulator, regulatory compliant, fully automated post-trade uh, infrastructure for financial services. 
We actually launched this uh, last year and we have further releases and innovations this year and next year. Um, it enables our markets or our participants to digitize their financial products with access to existing legacy, as Kelly said, but also on a new decentral network. Great. Thank you so much, Janina. Um, next, Sandra, if you could introduce yourself. Sandra Rowe, who is the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council, someone that we, we all know in the industry very well. Hi, Kelly, and thank you so much to the entire NYU Fubon team. It's been great listening to the morning sessions, and I have to say I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Sandra Rowe, the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council. Uh, I represent an organization that is a not-for-profit based in Geneva with nearly 400 institutional members cutting across uh, multi-jurisdictions and multi-industry. Um, I spend a great deal of my time also as an entrepreneur and uh, angel investor, so I see it from lots of different sides. The one topic I will say that comes up again and again, particularly at the enterprise level, is one around the roadblocks to scaling. And it's not just a technical point. It is a culture issue, meaning people getting their heads around how do we actually stop you know, uh, the old way of thinking and go to the new way of thinking, um, but then also getting the collaboration that you need across multi-stakeholders. And that's one of the biggest challenges because you sometimes do need to include government. Sometimes you do need to include technical and business side, or oftentimes you do, as well as working with um, entrepreneurs at FinTech startups or startups in general, as well as um, you know NGOs potentially or, or super nationals even. So there's a lot of extra collaboration that's required. It's a team sport, as many of us call it. And we're finding that that's a challenge that we will overcome, but we're definitely different pockets are struggling with how to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that introduction. Um, next, Tanya, can we go to you? Tanya Shastri, who is the Vice President of Products uh, for Blockchain at VMware. Thanks so much, Kelly, and wonderful to be on this panel with all of you. So um, just a quick introduction. Like Kelly mentioned, I'm VP of product uh, for blockchain at VMware. We have um, a, a special uh, business unit that's focused 100% on blockchain within the company. And for, for those of you who aren't familiar with VMware, a super short introduction. Uh, VMware has been around for over two decades. It's a uh, an enterprise technology company. We're bringing innovation to our customers so that they can accelerate their businesses. And we've taken that um, you know, uh, legacy that we have at VMware, a, a breadth of customers, over 600,000 customers in a range of industries. We have a strong presence um, in the securities industry with the largest exchanges, banks, broker dealers, and so on as customers of VMware. And so we have a deep appreciation for what it takes. And we, we understand that we have to partner very closely with our, with our customers as we bring this innovation to market. Um, and it is through that that we have, uh, you know, in deep collaboration with, with, our, with our customers brought our product, which is a platform, of, um, an enterprise blockchain platform that our customers can deploy their smart contracts or the apps on and, and run them, right? So I, essentially that's what, that's what we are doing. And, um, when, when, when you think about what do we as a technology provider think about, you know, there's some obvious things, right? There's the innovative technology itself. There's the shared source of truth. And, you know, how do you uh, do data integrity with malicious fault tolerance and privacy? So, I, you know, I won't necessarily focus on that so much because I think that's pretty obvious. That's, you know, the core of what we're, what we're bringing uh, in our product. But the two things that we really think about is, one, is extreme robustness because we are working with these customers who are running their businesses on us. Um, you know, the implications of things not working or going down to the industry can be really large. So really extreme robustness and the things we do to test and so on around that extreme robustness is, is certainly one piece. And related really is making this innovative technology familiar so that it isn't like this is something difficult or, you know, uh, untoward that you have to figure out, but, you know, extending it and making it familiar and, you know, things like upgrades and data management and, and, and um, you know, uh, ensuring that the, the, the compliance can be, can be maintained and so on, right? All those kinds of things um, can be kind of 
difficult in a sense because it's this the, the the underlying technology is complex so you have to do it in a way that stays true to the new technology but brings that familiarity right so bridging that uh, that gap is something we also focus a lot on so i'd say those are two that um, um, we spend a lot of time on in addition of course to the core uh, the core innovative technology Thank you, Tanya. That's this really helpful perspective. And uh, and last but not least on our panel, um, uh, rounding it out, Marjan Delatin, who is the Managing Director for Payments at Settle. Marjan, can you give us an introduction? Oh, you are on mute. Yeah. There you yes, go. I'm now back. we can hear you. <laughs> so hello, everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Marjan Delatin. As you mentioned, I'm the Head of Payments at Settle. Settle is the UK-based uh, DLT technology provider for financial institutions, uh, both on the capital market and payments. So I have been actually in blockchain for the last, I would say, five, six years. Uh, used to work as well for established market infrastructure such as, such as Swift and Euroclear and Ripple. So now, since a year, I'm with Settle. Um, just to make it very concrete about what, what we are busy with uh, today, uh, we are currently focused on a project that it is called the Regulated Liability Network, a so-called RLN. Um, and I think after a few years in this space, um, is one of a transformational way of looking at how the financial markets infrastructure will work in the, could potentially work in the future. So the idea behind that is about a single DLT with the central bank money, commercial bank money, and electronic money on the same chain. So it is a complementary, I would say, approach towards CBDC, central bank digital currency, and an alternative as well to a single bank coins. Um, it is very different from the way that we know the existing payment system that are mainly built on messaging between institutions. Uh, is the idea for a regulated financial market infrastructure where the values are represented and processed within the network itself. It is 24 by seven, has the finality of settlement, is, could represent multiple type of assets and is most importantly programmable through smart contracts. So the objective, I would say the ultimate objective is to build the next generation of the settlement on national currencies uh, and very much developed around the public and private partnership. So to turn this vision, so the regulated internet of value, I would say, um, into a concept um, and in partnership with many different partners, key in the, I would say, in the payment system space, we are busy designing and building a suitable architecture in terms of the scalability and interoperability. That's fantastic. Thank you. In fact, I'm going to pick up on those. So, so hopefully for the, the audience, it gave you a, a, a good lens into the depth and breadth of experience that, that these four colleagues have. Um, Janina and Marjan, I want to actually pick up on the, the points that you were making in your, your introductions. You're both leading work to create enterprise scale. Um, uh, Sandra used the word scaling. You're experiencing that scaling. You're using to create enterprise scale production solutions, very different from um, industry POCs of prior years in both of your spaces, securities, and payments. Uh, for, for us, can you give the insights and perspectives, um, can you share on how you bring a new technology in a practical way to market when the technology itself is still a bit of a mystery to the market? How are you working with market participants and others to not only bring them along the journey of your vision, but to get it practically implemented? Um, Janina, could you go first? Yeah, sure, definitely. And I think the key point here is information sharing with you, with your customers, with your partners, with especially with the regulator, as we as a German stock exchange are highly regulated, right? So to demystifying this technology is information sharing and transparency. But then on the other side, you have two perspectives. One is a business and one is a technical or technology perspective, right? Because the technology is a tool, but it's not an end in itself. So we need the business case first. And if we understand the pain points and the business case that this specific technology can solve, then you can, as you said, like demystifying the whole, the whole thing, right? And so if we have a specific problem, we can use 
the blockchain and DLT technology and everything around it to solve this specific issue. And then, as you said, like the corporate uh, cooperation and the communication with the customer, with the le- regulator to take them step by step on their approach, I think is very important as well. Um, I think from a technology perspective, it is important that you first gain the technology before you tra- make a transparency in them or before you take your customers on board with you. You have to have preferably internal use cases, gain experience with the technology, especially around the implementation to legacy structure. What are the pain points of you and then for the customers? And what are then possible solutions? I think these kind of the three-way, three-way part, yeah. It's interesting, Janina, right? Because it's it's there was so much hype about the technology initially, not really attached to a business case. Now we're getting back into the more of a BAU model that feels right, where you're focused on the business case. But to your point, in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to learn and know the technology itself. And I think for those of us in the industry, that's meaningful for, for us as providers as well. When, when you say that, are you talking not only about your organization, but, but how you're thinking about implementing and rolling it out with your clients? You, you run a market, to, to, be, yeah. to put it in perspective, so that the audience knows. It's, it's not just simply a system you're running for yourselves. No, you're yeah. operating an entire market infrastructure. So do you contemplate it that way? Yeah. So, I mean, we spent the last few years, actually, um, I think Deutsche Börse is active in the DLT space since 2016. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of internal use cases to, to learn about the technology, to have to solve our own pain points with like reconciliation processes and so on and so on. And now I think, um, especially the last year, we mature to a stage where we can take on or build our new um, like um, post-rate infrastructure to roll it out to the market and to tell the participants or ease their pain points because we have been there. We did this and then we take them by the hand and guide them through, through the process. Great. Thank you. Marjan, can you build on that too? You're as equally active, um, it, it's to make no mistake, the creation of a, of a digital currency payment system is, is, is probably transformative to an exponential power. But uh, can you talk about how you're practically doing that and moving beyond POCs to those, those structures, those infrastructure that will change the way currency operates? Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's a very complex uh, question, but, uh, but I try do your to best. simplify it. <laughs> um, well, I would say I would adhere actually to what Janina said in in uh, in relation to the technology is a means to an end, right? Um, if you look at uh, really across the payments industry um, and the innovation that it is brought by to the markets by fintechs. Um, this innovation is mainly focused on the front end, right? And it's not necessarily the back end because fintechs are not excited about the back end. Um, typically, and, and especially in the Europe, uh, and I would say in the UK, some of this, I would say, um, innovation in the payment space is coming, is driven by regulation, right? So PSD2, open banking, and it is opening the door to many different experiences on the consumer side. When we think about the blockchain and DLT in a regulated segment, the story is completely different because you get into the the interaction, especially with large institutions in terms of what is the problem that they try to solve, right? Uh, It's not only about taking in technology for technology, right? As you said, because this has been the case for the last few years. And then you get to the use case. Um, And as soon as you get to this kind of use case, I would say, you get to the back end and the plumbery of, I would say, the financial um, institution. So that means the existing legacies, the processes, and all these are very costly, right? Um, And I think um, um, at least the way I see, um, um, let's say, an adoption of the technology going beyond just, you know, technology, I see there are different angles that needs to be considered. This is not only about shifting from one version of technology to another. I think it's about changing the business models. It's also about mindset and culture. So um, to be honest, I think a a factor for success is um, in this kind of projects, you have to consider different angles um, and you have to navigate through that, I would say through this complexity in different layers of the institution that you are interacting. Um, I would say, um, again, in the last five, six years, um, I have been mainly and principally involved in building 
uh, networks, right? Cross-border networks. And this, this is very complex because in a network, you need ubiquity and scalability. And if you don't have the ubiquity, and this is limited by the adoption of the technology, it makes it more very complex. Um, so to be honest, I don't have a magical ball or a straight answer to that, but I think um, being conscious of um, adoption of a technology like blockchain or DLT is going beyond just you know, the plumbery. So you have to really navigate all these challenges. And I'm, I would say that my mission definitely is not completed <laughs> and there is a long way to go still. That's all right. That's at least your your honest start, which is amazing. Um, but I'm reflecting on what what both you and 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 Janina said, and and struck by two things that that there are some critical differences in how these transformation transformational projects are being implemented or deployed successfully. It's not just changing a technology to your to your last point um, or replacing something, but it's really a change in how technology is supporting a a, um, a new product or a new offering or a new service. Um, Tanya, can you can you pick up on that? For many of these projects, um, they're they're not just simply transformative; they're they're systemically important to businesses in financial services or others. So, can you talk a little bit about how your um, you and your team have focused on building enterprise grade? Ledger while incorporating the first use client feedback that that you have from the the many clients that you are, you have uh, working with you. Yeah, you know, I, to start with, right? I mean, the, the first point, and I think we've all said this in some way, right? There are various angles. There's collaboration required. There's transparency required. You have to have the business side and the technology all in the same conversation, right? So I think I'd say one very important pillar for us is to be collaborating very deeply with industry partners and with our customers and so on, right? We don't expect that we can go off and just do this by ourselves and, you know, someone will be able to use it and and make magic happen, right? So I think that's one principle we have, and we've really collaborated very deeply with some, you know, some of our public references, ASX, Broadridge and others, right? So um, that's, you know, that's one piece of the, the puzzle, but like I mentioned when I was introducing our, our product, right, we've at, at a foundational level, we've kind of first taken a look at the technology. Absolutely. There's this core, wonderful new uh, way that, uh, you know, things can be done. But how does the what does the enterprise need to adopt it? Right. There are things you're creating the shared source of truth, but enterprises require privacy. They require large, high scale performance, rapid finality of a transaction. Right. Uh, the ability to, you know, a blockchain, folks think about it as immutable, but enterprise use cases, there's terabytes of data going into this thing on a daily basis, right? You have to be able to prune it, but to be able to do it in a way that's true to the blockchain primitives, right? So do it in the right way with consensus. So, you know, there are all these things that are required for the enterprise use cases, especially when you think of production, right? If it's a POC, you do a little bit, you understand that there's value and you don't have to deal with the performance and, you know, the the privacy um, uh, while maintaining data integrity in every corner case and so on, right? So um, that's at its foundation. And, you know, we've built it from the ground up. This has come out of VMware research. um, And, you know, so I'd say that's that foundational core technology layer, right? And then when when we've been working with our customers to bring these things to production, it's been really interesting for us to see that, you know, there's this end-to-end financial uh, services um, system, right? And you're inserting something into this end-to-end system. And there are so many players that have to interact with each other and so on. So I think Marianne's point about ubiquity is interesting. It's about, you know, the ability for all that network of participants to be able to understand the technology, feel comfortable with it, right? And that's really the point I was making earlier about uh, making things familiar as well as extremely robust, right? So that there's confidence that these businesses can put their business on it, be able to talk to regulators, to be able to speak in the language that the regulators understand and translate it then to the technology and how the technology can make that happen, right? So... Uh, things, I, I just use a couple examples, right? Things like upgrades with data continuity, right? You don't think of those kinds of things on the, on, on the first day sometimes, but those are hard problems that you have to be able to solve before you can put these things in production, right? So how do we do that? How are we able to kind of do it in a way that's true to the blockchain pr- principles, but at the same time communicate and 
understand that this is a familiar thing. Yes, upgrades are familiar in the industry. How do you do it in the context of this uh, of this technology? Data capacity management, right? The scale and how do you scale? How is this horizontally scalable? Does it have to vertically scale, right? How much can it scale? All these kinds of things have to become, um, you know, not uh, not mysterious. It isn't mysterious anymore. It is it is real, and those are the those are the things that we've really focused on, and we find uh, you know those pieces very important. And then one, I'll just add one piece which um, I'll say has really resonated with our customers, right? We have we have tried to have a large surface area for what we support in that if, if you need to deal with your blockchain, it's not just the blockchain network, it's the drivers, right? We have a very deep integration with a DAML driver. We're extending now to an Ethereum driver and so on. So you, you work with one partner and, and we cover that entire stack, you know, yes, the hardware may, hardware may be yours, the application yours, but everything in between, you know, we have this large surface area that you can come to us, we'll make sure we're we're there with you. We understand it's a complicated journey, things change, but, you know, I'd say there's this courage, perseverance, you have to try different things, understand that our customers have to try different things as they bring these things to market, right? So I'd say that would be... Um, the, how we round out our thinking really about bringing this innovative, complex technology, but at the same time, how do we kind of play the role to reduce that complexity, make it familiar so that our customers can focus on the business problems, focus on how they would, you know, want to bring those, bring those uh, you know, very innovative, um, maybe they'll last for the next several decades, right? And yeah, yeah, how they yeah. Can on those things. I could see Janina smiling. I'm sure I can only imagine she she is living it firsthand what you're saying. But um, but what but I'd like to go to uh, to to Sandra because um, so Sandra in in your role as the CEO of GBBC, I guess I kind of always feel like you get to see it all. You get to see it from the perspective of those of us who are on the panel that that know you and your organization well. You have both providers and practitioners and users in in um, in in your group. So you're sort of getting a first person view of these key projects, um, not only how they're transforming a business opportunity, but how businesses can collaborate to create new opportunities, to create interconnected networks th themselves. And that's something we've seen you talk about a, a fair bit lately. Can you can you sort of build on some of these points and, and give some perspective from a, from a cross industry view and what you see emerging as new and not just simply changing what exists? Thanks very much, Kelly. And first of all, I applaud um, Janina, Tanya, Marjan, and Kelly. You guys are trying to do uh, big things in, a, in very difficult environments, having been at a market infrastructure, doing some of those early DLT projects. I will tell you, I, I share the pain of sometimes of trying to do the scaling work that you, know, you need to, to make things successful. But one thing I have seen that has really changed in the last five years is the increased um, focus on we're gonna target these specific business problems. We're going to implement the right technologies for that, but we're gonna remain a certain amount of flexibility as well because we know things are evolving. So the whole concept around wedding yourself to necessarily um, one technology and then um, you know thinking that you're gonna have that for a decade, I think there's a lot more flex in thinking around, okay, we may have to actually be um, doing this today but tomorrow we may need to add on or we may need to be a bit more flexible. And let's talk to industry peers. Let's talk to the fintechs. Let's talk to the startups. There's a lot more collaboration going on. And what we do at the GBBC and I spend all my days doing is helping to connect some of the dots. As you're sitting in different parts of the world, focusing on your businesses, uh, we help try to shed light on so-and-so is doing this, you should go talk to them. Or we're involved in this consortium, maybe perhaps you should get involved too. And I think um, from topics around large scale uh, sustainability to standards work, uh, there are a myriad of topics that actually require a global lens and that's critical that we all keep talking, but also doing. The doing part is is, is important, thank you. Um, it, 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 it certainly, um... Uh, is is uh, the the sort of the core of what um, what the folks here are getting at, and so that's a really good uh, lead in. I, I just want to ask Marjan though to lead into another question that I'll get to, but I want to ask Marjan before we come off of this topic to um, 
to reflect on some something standard that you said and build on a little bit more on cross industry solutions and and Marjan sort of embedded in what or implied in what you've said is that there is a solution or the the payments approach you're taking is across the industry. It's not sort of just one provider doing it and and duplicating it over. Um, could you give a, a bit of comment on that margin? And then Sandra, if you want to comment um, on what she says as it ties back to what you've said, that would be great as well. Of course. Um, well, um, I would say um, that um, in nascent technology like DLT, that in order to make it transformational, I think in cooperation, collaboration, competition, all these are necessary. And I think most of the companies today, they they have learned uh, from the experience the last uh, 10 years, I would say, within the blockchain. Um, if I just give you an example with regards to uh, the, the way that we are thinking about how we can improve, you know, the capacity or, or capabilities, is when we started, when you are thinking about a network that needs to be scalable, ubiquity and all these angles, um, sometimes DLT in an existing form has its own uh, uh, limitations, right? Um, so uh, my feeling is sometimes we shouldn't be less ideologic around, around DLT uh, and try to combine some of the, let's say, key features that are really essential and, and the value of the DLT with even some other technologies, for instance, the technologies like, okay, sorry, I'm not a technical person, I'm trying to simplify, Apache Kafka, you know, this is typically a kind of technology that it is used by uh, Silicon Valley's platforms that is, is enabling uh, a, a scalability that it is beyond uh, what payments uh, infrastructure and systems can cope with. So the way that we, we were thinking in the beginning of, you know, this reflection around how we can build a a network. We said, okay, why not uh, combining, you know, the essential part of the blockchain with with this, let's say, uh, state engine or events management that it is much more performant than it is today blockchain. So, we we actually tested that in the AWS environments, um, and we managed to get to one million TPS. Right. So this is this is very interesting because we have we see as well um, recently uh, in in the U.S. for instance MIT and uh, Boston, uh, Federal Reserve Boston they came as well with a new um, 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 research in terms of uh, really getting a scalability of on, on the blockchain or DLT for 1.7 million uh, TPS. Um, so it, it's, I'm, I'm, the way I I would say is. Um, the more we get this blockchain, and this goes back to the integration, the more the more we get these concepts or these capabilities into the existing world by cooperation between incumbents. You know, for instance, working with an organization like Swift uh, enables a lot because they have a kind of digital identity that it is very, uh, they call it KPI, uh, PKI, excuse me, that it's there. And all of the financial institution that have Swift infrastructure, they use it. So I think you have to be open to any other angles that it is working well uh, in order to integrate that into a, 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 an architecture that it is, of course, running on a much better technology, lots of more securities, you know, and immutability that are really part of the blockchain. So I would really think about alone, this is not a business that we can make that mainstream and scalable. It's definitely a room for collaborating and cooperating with uh, with partners. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like even the way you're describing it, if I married it up uh, from what uh, Tanya has been talking about, what Janina was commenting on earlier about her network, you might even say that some of these solutions, it's a necessary condition now to be able to work with them. What's what's different is what Sandra was touching on, what Tanya was touching on, is that the technology now enables that. I mean, the fact, the truth is, is I think we've all, and probably many of our participants, been around in the industries long enough that there were many uh, cross-industry attempts and consortiums to come together. And they they would have brilliant ideas, but then they would die at the moment when we had to agree which among us was going to get to hold everybody else's data and be trusted to do that. What you're talking about, what you're all talking about, 
is now that it is a technology that enables that privacy to be preserved. And that not only simply creates the projects within organizations that you're talking about, but now creates the ability for a network of networks to be created where applications can start to interoperate across the industry. And I think that's, you know, that is the, the key difference from what has been previously discussed as sort of theory over across the industry in years and is now translating into the, to the practical um, implementation. Um, with that, we have about um, a nine uh, or 10 minutes left. I'm going to go sort of with two, um, two sets of questions for the, for the whole panel to, to take it a minute or so to comment on each. Um, so to round out the views that we were talking about, first one very specific to the topic, it seems that DLT or smart contract or blockchain implementations, what I, what I infer and what all of you are saying is that they're moving at a much faster pace then, then frankly, we would have even just seen a year ago. Um, um, what would you say are the reasons? What are some? What has caused that to to change? Um, Janina, could you go first? Yeah, um, I think main point is maturing regulation. I mean, we have especially in Europe, so Deutsche Börse acts within Germany and Luxembourg um, mainly. We see the regulator moving at a very fast pace. We have. Um, a new electronic securities law, which enables our um, issuance of digital native securities. You have uh, Luxembourg Blockchain X. On the European level, you have the pilot regime. So you're seeing this being picked up on a more mature level and the regulator is not asking questions anymore. So they implement new technologies and then overall a better understanding of the technology and the benefits and moving out of POCs and actually having experience with the different ledger technology, smart contracts, all of this together, I think this is um, moving up the pace quite a lot. Yeah, that's, that's actually, that's really good insight. I hadn't thought about it. I get to work so closely with you. I hadn't thought about it in that context. So that's good insight. Um, uh, Tanya, your thoughts? Yeah, from my perspective, right, I, in a way, there are some things that are natural to new technology, right? There is this initial cycle of trying things out, the, the hype cycle that we know of, right? And in initially, blockchain could solve world hunger, right? So people trying to do too many different things with it. I think now it's quite clear with the, the range of conversations we're having with our customers that there's a lot of clarity for where and how and why they want to apply the technology, right? So it's not POCs just for the sake of doing them. It's very much about this is a valuable business proposition and it's our first step into going to kind of taking this to production and so on, right? So um, I'd say there's a much there's a much better clarity of where and how the technology will really add value. There's um, there's an appreciation for um, you know the, the complexity that it takes to kind of bring these things together. And then also I think there's a there's this you know a, a combination of long term and near term kind of thinking that we see happening. Right. It's it's clear to a lot of folks we speak with that there's a wide range of things where this technology can help them out. So they know that in the long term, they, they want to do something here, right? And then in the near term, folks are picking things that are maybe lower risk. You know, Janina mentioned, you can even have internal use cases within different departments and, you know, internal treasury use, use cases for interdepartment kinds of things. There are things that may be a little bit more of a central operator kind of operating it for a market. For, for a set of market participants. So I think there's a range of things in that journey that, 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 that our customers are kind of looking at and saying, okay, let's get started with this. We know there's a lot more we can do, but let's you know, take these first few and get started. So I think it's that combination of um, having spent the time to try things out, having an appreciation for the technology and where it can uh, bear fruit and knowing that this is a long-term investment that they want to make. So let's get started kind of the thing, right? I think with, with those three, we're seeing a, um, um, a lot of um, a shift in mindset from a POC to let's go to production. Let's start taking the steps to go there. And, you know, let's deal with all the complexity that comes with it. Well, Just so. taken on as it comes. That's, that's fair. Um, Sandra, your thoughts? I'm just going to say quickly, uh, digitization and the fact that we've all been sitting in front of screens for the last two years has advanced everything on the digital side and blockchain and digital assets are just one of the um, industries, you know, benefiting from all of that. I think secondly, the real business um, cases for the benefits of blockchain and DLT, as Tanya said, has absolutely come to fruition in terms of understanding and education. And now we're at the place of scaling, removing frictions, 
and getting this to work in a robust and secure fashion. We didn't talk about cybersecurity, but that comes up all the time related to how do we build out these systems, right? And, and allow for people to work together. So those two things alone, I think it's really driven why we're in a sweet spot right now than we were six years ago. Yeah, very insightful, thank you. Marjan, your thoughts as well. Yeah, but very last point I would say, again, I'm coming back probably to, to how, how this, uh, let's say, this paradigm get closer to the, to the regulators, I think in the payment space, the, the advent of the CBDC, the central bank digital currency, it's really creating a different momentum for sure. Um, it's opening the door, even though you don't need necessarily to use a DLT, but um, the, the tokenization and the way that we see it among major central banks around the world is, is still on DLT. I think this, this creates a uh, um, and open the door for many, many interactions between the public and private sector, because at the same time, it creates some uh, uncertainty with regards to the way that the private money will continue uh, to exist uh, um, if the CBDC model will be a direct distribution in the, as a liability of central bank. So clearly, I think this, this has a very transformational um, uh, place in terms of changing the dialogue uh, with, the, with the oversight. Um, but it's not ending there, of course, right? Because uh, at the end, I think that the, one of the complexity that, that, that it is important and is becoming more and more important is the interoperability with the systems and with the existing world. And I think there, the solution or the collaboration uh, with organization is very important. I think that that's basically the scope of our conversation with, yeah. with digital asset as well, in terms of how you can really use the, the power of the smart contract in terms of creating this interoperability. So I think, yeah, um, I see clearly a different momentum in 2022 uh, for uh, DLC and blockchain. All right, well, we have two minutes left. I think this has been a great conversation with some amazing leaders in, in tech and financial services. Kathleen, if you can indulge me, we have a diverse panel here representing different ages and stages uh, in our careers, but it is a, a panel of females. So I'm going to add, which is tends to be useful for the technology space. So I'm going to ask each of them to give a sound bite, one piece of advice you would give to the next generation of fintech leaders, uh, particularly those that are, are looking to explore the STEM space. Sandra? There are a lot of naysayers out there and don't get me wrong, you should listen to critique, but don't tell people, don't let listen to people tell you you can't do something. If I listened to those people, I wouldn't be anywhere. Thank you. Tanya? Yeah, I think from my perspective, what I'd like folks to know is I'm learning so much from the next generations, right? And I'm, you should know that you are teaching us. So there's no reason why you can't be doing even more than what we're doing. So go, go forth and conquer. <laughs> Excellent. Marjan. I would say take risk. <laughs> I think this is very important for any, um, any female in terms of underestimating uh, feeling that we have sometimes as a as a as a female, I think this is this is definitely wrong, and there is place, and we see that more and more uh, leadership, female leadership, moving from uh, finance banks, you know, typical banks or more very established uh, businesses uh, towards um, uh, new fintechs and new businesses, and with the large, you know, such, such as CEOs. So I think that's very how do you say it's very uh, supportive. Uh, for where the females will be in the uh, next 30 years, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and Janina. Yeah, I think similar to what all the other panelists said, don't be afraid to ask questions. It is such a fast paced industry and nobody has a perfect answer because what you knew yesterday is not what you need to know tomorrow. And there are no dumb questions. Always go for it and don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you so much. I'm going to simply add, seek out people like, like these panelists where you can, you can improve your own expertise with the caliber and quality of those around you. And so with that, I will thank uh, NYU and the Fubin Center, Kathleen, Elizabeth, and their team for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for an amazing panel. You all tackled some foundational and fundamental changes in major league market infrastructure and payments. You talked about all the fantastic advances in DLT and DeFi with regard to all the technology and privacy issues and so forth. And you end on an incredibly empowering message. 
for which we're all very, very appreciative and grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.